Uh, welcome to the Utah Puck Report. I'm your host, Jay Stevens. Uh, again, this is we got we got to thank our sponsors, Jersey Mike's Subs. Go get a Jersey Mike's. Uh, they're constantly doing like today. I know 100 percent of the proceeds from today's sales go to help the Make a Wish Foundation, and they're constantly doing things to help the local community. And they're even helping our little show. So go support Jersey Mike's. Uh, I want to talk about our first guest, our only guest today, is Jeff Levy. So. For me, growing up in Utah, when I first became a goaltender, the only thing I heard about was Jeff Levy. Well, there was Jeff Levy, and then there was Jeff Tavey. So, uh, so Jeff, uh, honestly, like one of my first years of playing hockey, uh, one of the highlights was going to Jeff Levy Day. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you've got a, you're you're a couple years older than me. You don't look like it now. Now I'm the one that looks old. But uh, uh, tell me a little bit about like growing up in Utah. Where, when did you even start playing, and where were you playing at? Uh, so I grew up in Salt Lake, uh, right up the road, mile uh, from the Hygieia facility, which was in Sugar House. It's no longer there. There's now a uh, residence extended stay or something like that, and uh, uh, they had a, a rink there, and it got knocked down. But I started with the uh, the neighbor, the neighbor's backyard. They froze over their backyard, and it was much colder for some reason back uh, when I was a kid and we started skating in their backyard with them and as a little brother you always get put in the net right and the the older the neighbor kids were older as well so I ended up starting with the goal pads on and um, I had a a, 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 some guys in the neighborhood who were also I looked up to as goalies Roger Rugelow was one of them Uh, he ended up going to the same high school Highland High School in that area and it, it worked out over the years he was a senior uh, the, the year before I came in as a freshman. So I was able to uh, step right in and play um, right after he graduated high school. But that's where I spent my youth hockey, played for um, Team Utah, the travel team, as well as in the house league back then. So, so I played a lot of hockey. Who were the coaches back then? Who, who was coaching you like on, uh, on the, the Team Utah? Uh, Buzz Burns. Oh, yeah. And my, my, my dad. Spent a lot of years behind the bench uh, coaching us. Um, we had a, a number of travel team coaches that were in and out, but, uh, you know, so many years ago, they slipped my, <laughs> their name slipped my mind. It was a long time ago. Like you said, I'm old. I'm old school Utah <laughs> hockey here. Yeah. Yeah, well, I just wanted to know because I knew, I knew that Buzz Burns coached you, and I know your dad coached, but Buzz is an – I got to have Buzz on the show because his is a name that comes up all the time. He seemed to do a lot of uh, good things for a lot of people in this market growing up. Do, by chance, do you remember whose yard it was that you were skating in? Yeah, yeah, it was the Mellings. It was uh, George and Nancy Melling. Um, Tom Melling was their son, and yeah. he was also older. Uh, but uh, they they did it for a number of years, and we were they were featured in the Deseret News, a uh, big article on the, what they were doing, and I don't know uh, if others were doing it back then but uh, they they had the spotlight on them and my picture made the paper and i i have that picture frame of me and my goalie pads on and the pads are on the the wrong legs and nice. I, have the, I have the baseball glove you know and i have all the hand-me-down equipment um, That's awesome. so i have i have that five-year-old picture framed um that was my start yeah, you'll have to send my... me that picture we'll put it up on the utah park report page okay. that'd, be, that'd be amazing yeah, all right so was, tell, tell me a little bit now nowadays if you play Utah high school hockey, a lot of people figure that you've missed your boat, right? You've missed the opportunity to get out of Utah and go play in those AAA or whatever. But here, that was basically what we had at the time, right? So you're playing for Highland High School, and how do you get out of here? Who, how does this happen? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how I got the bug, but I wanted, I wanted to play at a higher level. I think it was occasionally I'd, I'd f- find a uh, – uh, a game on, on TV, a uh, uh, Wisconsin hockey game or a college hockey game. And I thought, I, you know, I'd like to try that. I'd like to try my luck again. Uh, moving on. Um, so my junior year of high school, I looked to uh, go to the East Coast and play prep school. And um, I was, uh, I, I didn't have the, the top grades, but I got into a small prep school called St. George's. It was in uh, Rhode Island. And so I registered and all the big schools, all the Avon Old Farms and all those big name schools, hockey schools, prep schools that could move kids on. They, I never, I didn't get in. I wasn't, uh, I didn't have either the, the hockey 
uh, backing from a coach or whatever. They didn't know about me. They didn't know if I had ability and let alone my grades were average. So I ended up signing up to go to this small prep school. And in preparation, I went to Brainerd, uh, Minnesota hockey schools in Brainerd, Minnesota oh, yeah. for the whole summer, signed up for the whole summer. And um, over the course of that summer, uh, Junior A Rochester Mustangs in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, caught, I caught their eye with my work ethic and my ability. And they brought me on as a young guy to be their third string goaltender as a senior in high school. And I worked hard and I played nine games that first season there. I opted out of going to uh, prep school my senior year because I thought this was a better opportunity for my hockey, which it turned out to be. And uh, the following season in the USHL, I was a starting goaltender, had, the, had that role secured. Um, and then the next year I just rolled with it and we had a great team and had great success. Yeah, so that's one of the things that I think people need to understand, too, is that uh, and, and you're a perfect example. And it seems like most of the Utah players that get out of here. And I know for me, like and I joke around about it, but my best ability was my availability. Like I was willing to be there every day. I was willing to put in the work. I never had the talent. I didn't have the, the you know, I didn't start till I was 15 years old. So I didn't have any backing at all. But yeah. For most of the Utah players that get out, it's, it's important for me to hear that story that, that you just said is that, you know, you're willing to put in the work and oh, yeah. you were willing to take that, that third position and then work your way up from that. A lot of people now, and honestly, I think it's the parents because they'll see, oh, I'm not going to let my kid be the third guy. I'm going to send him to a lower league or, you know, they've got so many junior A minus leagues now. Like, <laughs> I'd rather pay 10 grand to have my kid be the starter than have my kid go to the USHL or whatever to, and be a third guy and work his way in. But well, that's a, it's, a, it's a tough balance, right? It is. It's difficult. Um, Division one uh, college hockey coaches have, have said to me as a goaltender, you got to be playing. So that's not the role I took. That's not the route I took. Uh, you know, it's, I guess it's, it's an opinion. Uh, what you think is going to be best for your own career and development. You do have to play and develop uh, as a goaltender, but you do have to be available. Um, it's a tough call. It yeah. really is. I think uh, game experience uh, is a, it means a lot. Um, eventually, I think in my career, uh, having grown up in Utah where we played only six months out of the year, if that playing a limited amount of games, 20 to 30 games with travel, hockey, and everything over the course of the winter, um, the lack of experience compared to other areas of our country and Canada um, caught up to me uh, eventually in my career, but I had a good run. Um, that decision was right for me versus going to prep school. Um, I just, he got to kind of be lucky to succeed as well in the sport. Cause I think there are a lot of players out there that are very, very, very good. They go undiscovered and their careers just end. Right. And it's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I, for me, I was We're, lucky. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about that. Look, so you go from, you're playing in the USHL of Rochester. And then, you know, you take over the starting role. And, and then, obviously, you're doing well in the USHL, which at the time, um, that was it. I mean, for junior A hockey, that legitimately, for U.S.-born players, that was it. We had the USHL. We didn't have all these other options called junior A, right? Junior B, junior C, or whatever. But yeah. you're killing it at the top league. And then you end up going to college. Yeah. So, uh, I had a good – I was on a good team. That always helps as a goaltender, right? You always – win more games, you have better statistics, you have better defense in front of you, you have goal support, so you win more hockey games. So you look better on paper. But regardless, I mean, I had to win the spot from the guy next to me that also wanted to win the spot. And um, So my, that first year in my nine games, I think I was 7-1-1. One, and, one. I, I, and I beat some top and lower level teams in, in the standings. But uh, the following season, I battled for that top starting goaltending spot. Um, we had a good returning team. We had a lot of players get Division One scholarships that season. Uh, we ended up winning the national championship in the USHL. Uh, they did have the NAL back then, the NHL. Um, it wasn't quite what it is today. Right. But uh, in, the, in the national uh, tournament, three teams from the USHL then played against three teams from the, the NAL. It was a six-team playoff for the national championship. We ended up winning the national championship. Um, we beat a CompuWare team that was like 53 and 0 at the time, but they were playing 
in a league that wasn't quite the USHL. Um, so uh, that was a great season for me. Had a lot of good success. Had a good team in front of me. Um, must have gotten noticed somewhere along the way. Uh, ended up going to the University of New Hampshire on a hockey scholarship. And um, in that off season, prior to going to UNH, um, I was picked up by the Minnesota North Stars in the seventh round. So uh, again, I continued to go back to Brainerd to train because that's where I kind of caught my first break and it was a good environment to train. Um, but the guys who ran that, that Brainerd hockey school were also the scouting staff, staff for the North Stars. So um, I continued to, to work hard and they saw that and noticed that and thought I'd be a good pro prospect. So got uh, drafted prior to heading to, to college. So was that, was it Kevin Constantine? Is that who was running it back then? He was, and he was also the coach of the, the Rochester Mustangs in the USHL. Okay. All right. All right. So, I did not realize uh, that. Yeah. Uh, the year I ended up going to Rochester, he had left and taken a pro coaching job. So he turned it over to uh, coach Mark Kaufman, who did a nice job with us, but he also inherited uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a really good team that Constantine had put together. Yeah. Yeah, Constantine's underrated, and and his name comes up a lot. He really helped me get out of Utah. He also helped Jordan Parisi, who's usually the co-host of the show. Mm -hmm. uh, one of two co-hosts. Gary uh, Michaels is not here today, also. But it's funny how often Kevin's name comes up as far as helping goalies. Which sure. Is not yeah. really, you know, Kevin was kind of mean to goalies. <laughs> You know, if you played for him, he was... I don't know if he was mean to... I'm nice to any of his players, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he got he was, it I was scared to death of that guy. Oh, my heck. To skate on the same ice as him was uh, was a little stressful. I mean, he, yeah. he probably went through more sticks than a player did in the season. Okay, the so did he, he was throwing them into the Raptors or he was just breaking them? Uh, he, I, as far as I could see, he was just breaking them. Okay. Yeah. Not on players, mostly on the boards or the – Yeah, right, right. <laughs> not right on, not I, on I was telling the story just the other day of how um, my opportunity of playing with Kevin – we learned to keep an extra one of his sticks nearby because every once in a while he'd lose his mind and mm -hmm. he'd throw his stick into the Raptors. And then you had to hand him a stick right away or he's going to be angry that he didn't have a stick or couldn't get his stick. So if you wanted to not get back skated, we had another stick handy. And then that became a current theme that I, I learned with my coach in junior college and then Sean Thorson, who was my coach at, uh, when I was at Weaver State. I just realized all these coaches had the same mentality of losing their mind when somebody would blow a drill, throwing their stick into the rafters, and then getting mad that they didn't have their stick. So you either had to have somebody in the rafters that could hurry and grab that stick or just have one of their, like, a stick that they could use close. Yeah, I was fortunate. I, did, I, I didn't play for coaches like that too, too much along the way. I mean, I had the occasional coach that would take a slap shot and, at, a, at a player because they screwed it up. But <laughs> it, was, it was a rare thing. I. I, I I enjoyed playing for for players, coaches, uh, more so. Uh, but I was uh, <clears throat> as a goaltender, I was pretty self motivated and tried to fly under the coach's radar a lot and just you know, right, work hard. Right. So tell me about that draft day. Like, did you know you were going to get drafted? Oh, it's, it's funny. Uh, so I growing up, uh, I was a very uneducated hockey guy. Uh, you know, I just I enjoyed it. I like to go out there and uh, compete and try to stop the, the best players coming down on the ice uh, in practice and in, and in games. But we didn't have the internet then. Uh, we didn't uh, have the, the t TV coverage and all the information we didn't have then. So I, the draft didn't mean much to me. Uh, so when I was back in Minnesota, that's when, that's when I, the draft took place in the summer and it really didn't mean much to me. And, you know, I heard, oh, the draft, the draft. And there were players there that were hopefuls, a couple top couple rounds, but I had no intention, no idea I was going to potentially be drafted at all. And uh, and I just went about my business on a normal day of, of camp, and you go do your dryland training, and you go to the rink, and you go to the, the cabin, and you get your lunch, and you get your peanut butter sandwich. And um, in the middle of the, middle of the day, uh, uh, the uh, Chuck Grillo's wife, who was run – the, ran the camp more or less um in the cafeteria she came up to me and said hey by the way uh you got drafted in the seventh round by the north stars today and <laughs> wow. as an uneducated guy i was just like oh okay uh, that's probably pretty cool 
Don't Ooh, know what gosh. that means. I really don't know. I mean, that's neat. Maybe, you know, that's a, good, a great thing, I, I guess. So, I mean, <laughs> eventually, you know, they watch, watch out for you and they hear their property and it, and, and, and it can evolve into, into quite a bit. So, um, I went along. I just went on with my business. It didn't mean too much to me. It was cool. It's a, it's a nice thing to look back and say, kind of bragging rights. You know, I got picked up in the NHL draft. Yeah, that's um, huge bragging event, rights. It's amazing. Yeah. Eventually, I signed with them because I had a pretty good college career too. Yeah. And, they, and, and I was next in line for uh, a, a spot that they needed another goaltender in their, in their organization. So uh, they took, took advantage of having drafted me. Um, my pro career probably didn't uh, work out to, to be as good as they had hoped. But um, I don't know. My goal, uh, like I said, I, I didn't have the experience, I don't think, to, to be a good pro hockey player uh, growing up in the environment I did at the time. So it's, I it's think weird. now... It, say that, because now you're a guy that had USHO games. You're a guy that had college games. Typically, yes. that's, those are the things that you need. Or in, in theory, that's what you need. I, do you think you, like being in Utah, you lost a foundation that you should have had later? Absolutely. Yeah. Really? And, 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 and what I've done with my son, as you know, my son's a 19-year-old goaltender who's headed down the path of a junior hockey right now. Um, and what I've done with him along the years is I've, I've learned from how I could have made myself a better pro player or given myself a better opportunity to, to further my career. And the two things, fundamentals in hockey and goaltending. And so I've tried to harp on him with good fundamentals and coaching and and development of his fundamentals as well as experience so he's gone and played triple uh, a hockey over in colorado the last five out of six seasons ended up playing 40 to 50 games a, a season so he won't have the obstacle that i thought that shortened my career okay. i've kind of made sure that he's going to have the experience um, when i say that yeah i did have ushl experience and college hockey experience but I went from my junior year of hockey in Utah, playing probably 15, 20 games a season, six months out of the year, to three years later, signing with an NHL hockey team and playing with the best players in the world at training camp and in the minor leagues. So it was a pretty quick, drastic transition and jump, which okay. I wasn't quite ready for. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. I get that. Yeah. I just, with that uh... being said, Jay, I mean – when you have a great college hockey career and they come to you and say, Hey, sign a contract and play, we'll pay you money to play pro hockey. You're not going to say, no, thanks. I'm not ready. Right. right. You're going to give it all you got. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Where so, do I sign? I want to talk to you about that. Uh, and I want to talk to you about your pro career, but I think we're leaving out a big part. And that was uh, like, you were part of the Olympic trial that you got to yeah. try out for team USA for the Olympics, right? I did. Yeah. And you so, were, like, so from my standpoint here as a Utah guy, right. Um, I think this was, I can't remember what year it was, but it's funny because I'm, I live in the house that I grew up. The only house that I knew that we could watch college hockey was uh, Terry Warner. I don't know if you remember Terry, but I ended up buying his parents house. So I live in, in this house where we used to come over here and be able to watch you play college and listen to them talk about Jeff Levy, the next Olympic goaltender and <laughs> how I can't, who was, there was, there were three of you yeah, really yeah. competing for, for the start. It was uh, Rob Dunham, uh, and, and, and oh, who's the other guy? Yeah, was it Gar Snow? Gar Snow. They're Mike, both from. So Maine. Mike Dunham and Gar Snow. Mike Dunham, excuse me. Yeah. Mike Dunham and Gar Snow. That's what both I thought. Both from the University of Maine. It yeah. was crazy that have, they could have both those goaltenders of that caliber at the same school with Paul Korea and. And they split time. Yeah. Well, I don't know how you would think Sean, one of them would that, just do that. Like, head coach, Ooh. the head coach Sean Walsh got in a lot of trouble because he did a lot of. You know about all that, right? The, 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 having having have them both all, there and there. Well, and he bent some rules to get all <laughs> to get all those players there. I, I was I was able to play with a lot of those guys and another goaltender named Blair Allison, mm -hmm. who uh, was in the mix there at Maine and took over after Gar Snow left. But yeah, that's how is that they didn't follow all the NCAA rules. And later, uh, Sean Walsh got fired from coaching Maine because he broke all the NCAA rules after he won. What like back to back national championships? Yeah, they were but good. ten guys in the NHL. Paul Korea, both those goalies played amazing. 
but I mean, so that's, that's tough competition. Those are two all American goaltenders yeah. that were at the top of their game and went on to have pretty good NHL careers. They did. And that's, that's a little frustrating for me because I would compete with them and I would beat them in college. Uh, we'd, we'd battle with Maine at UNH, but, uh, um, regarding your, your comment about the Olympics, they went on to become the Olympic goaltenders. Um, uh, my sophomore year, I'd signed with the North Stars, and I played one year in the organization. And the following year, the, the year the Olympics came up, and I went to the trials and ended up making the team. Um, that was the first year that uh, they were going to use uh, – last year, they're going to use amateur players before they went to the Dream Team. And they wanted to duplicate what they did in 1980 – where they had the pre-Olympic tour for six months oh, yeah. and have the team practice and play together. So they were going to carry three goaltenders. And I ended up making the team and uh, as a third goaltender. And eventually, a month or two into that pre-Olympic tour, they, they figured out they, didn't, they weren't playing enough games for all three of us to, to play. Um, so uh, they, they asked if the North Stars, after they had lo- loaned me to the Olympic team, if they would take me back uh, for the season, but they still wanted me to go over to the Olympics. And, um, and they, were, they were a little disgruntled about, you know, we loaned him to you in good faith. But uh, long story short, they said, you know what, we'll take him back. But no, we're not going to have him go over to the Olympics and sit in the stands for three weeks and not develop. And so unfortunately, it didn't work out that I w- walked in the Olympic Games and oh, man. wasn't on that team. But uh, I had a great experience for a couple months traveling with the team and <laughs> Hank jokes. He can't believe I, I saved a few things from, from that experience. I had a, uh, a track suit, all blue, <laughs> uh, kind of silky, uh, uh-huh. saved it for years and years and years. And I just got tired of hauling it around. Eventually I gave it to the desert industries. And, uh, to this day, Hank wants to strangle me. My son wants to strangle me for doing that where he would love to have had that or seen that at this point in time. But yeah. we Jeez. joke that there's somebody uh, walking around wearing that, yeah. a- a- acting as an Olympian or whatever. But it's a funny story. But oh, man. That's... it was a good experience nonetheless. I mean, it's just another bump in the road of hockey and development and bouncing around. So tell us about Jeff Levy Day. How did that come about? What do you remember <laughs> from that? So Jeff Levy Day, as is, is you re- referred to that right off the bat here with our chat, that was uh, at the, the old Delta Center downtown. Um, that was when uh, the IHL was still around. Uh, the IHL uh, was on the east, uh, west coast, right? And the AHL is on the east coast. And they were both farm teams to the NHL. I was playing for uh, the North Stars farm team in Kalamazoo, Michigan at the time in the IHL. And we came to town to play against, they were the Grizzlies then? No, they were Golden Eagles still. Golden Eagles still? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was a nice honor. Um, we played a two game uh, weekend against them and uh they honored me one one evening uh when i got the start uh they asked i think our, our coach what, what the rotation would be with our goaltenders and it was early on in the season in my first year as a pro and uh salt lake <clears throat> honored me with they called it jeff levy night let all the amateur hockey players in to watch the game for free and um they gave me a nice presentation plaque uh, for, for what, what I'd done or had accomplished as a Utah hockey player, having grown up here as an amateur hockey player. It was really nice honor. It was spectacular. And um, it was great. I, I played really well. I played hard. And we ended up winning that game. So it was a wonderful experience and, and evening for me to have that uh, notoriety and presentation. Yeah, I bet that just had to be amazing. I was there. I was one of the youth that got in free or whatever. And I just, it was so cool. And it was so cool for all of us as, as local people. Um, I think that was like my second or third year playing. I didn't start until I started with Murray High. That was my first yeah. team I ever played for. And so for us, and it, it didn't ever register for me, like that, you know, that there was that opportunity. But for other guys on my team that had grown up playing here, to go and watch one of their own. And we're all such f- huge fans of yours. And everybody's afraid of your brother. Your brother would kill, like, just, your brother's built like a <laughs> linebacker. And just, just, I just remember watching him lay guys out. He actually punched me a few times one time when I was in net one time. Oh, that's funny. Um, I don't doubt that. He was a, he was an all state football player. Yeah. That also could skate. Yeah. So. He was, and he was awesome. Like, it was awesome. He was mean. I, yeah. And he was mean. And what I, I remember one time I stacked my pads back when we did that. Yeah. And, 
I stacked him and he was still standing there and I kind of pushed him with my feet and he fell over me. And then he just oh. pummeled me while he was on top of yeah. me. Uh, yeah. One of those where you accidentally fall and punch the guy yeah. in the head. No, no, I'm like, okay, that was a mistake on my part. I should not <laughs> let that guy fall on top of me. I learned that lesson. But for all of us to see somebody go through and to go to, go to Jeff Levy night at the game was just, it was huge. I can't, I mean, it, it was big for me, but I can't imagine what it was like for other people that went, hey, I have a shot at this because if I played with that guy. And, yeah. You know, because. And he's not that good at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I'm saying at all. But, well, no, no, but they all say I scored on him. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's true, too. You get that a lot. But it, it's just big. And I don't know if you realize the impact you probably had on this market just by doing what you did and having the work ethic and making it as far as you did. Yeah. So, well, that, well, that night, yeah. That it was, night it was a nice honor. People. It was a nice honor. It really was. I wish I could have continued on to have a, a, a stellar professional career. Um, I had some ups and downs as a pro. Um, I continued to work hard and enjoy the game, but uh, I played I played a lot of minor league hockey over the years. Uh, I played out my three years with the Minnesota North Stars organization, and I got out of the sport because I was a little frustrated and I wasn't going to resign at that level. Um, got out of the sport for five years, Jay, and then I was like uh, tired of working, so I thought, what can I do now? Went back. I had a buddy who was uh, in El Paso at the time. And I went back and played for another five years of pro hockey, just Rio riding Grand? bus. Uh, El Paso for two years, Rio Grande for two years. And I was in Jacksonville, Florida for a couple months of a season before I started that back up. But, uh, you know, hockey's been awesome for me. And um, it was a good run. You know, I played a lot of competitive hockey and I put off work for a long time to be able to play hockey and ride a bus. Yeah. Um, it was fun. When I went back, uh, it was on my terms, and I played better than I, I had as, as a pro initially. And I can say to myself, hey, if I had played like that uh, through my three years of under contract with the North Stars, I would have maybe continued my pro career at that level or higher. So um, there's, there's a I, mindset uh, that changes a little bit when you come back, right? Like you, yeah. you kind of I, – I think – and granted, my career – has not actually been a real career. My career has been fake and, and just happenstance and being in the right place at the right time. But I noticed that once I became a career fireman yep. and I was still getting calls to go sit the bench or whatever, play that RHI, which I know you, you also played. I think you took my spot, actually. I won't bring that up. Uh, <laughs> Did uh, I? Sorry. With I Phoenix, right? You so Phoenix? Yeah, Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix. Yeah, I was there the year before that. But, and, and they didn't invite me back. They figured they had their quota of youth goalies. But uh, they, it's funny when you have the mindset, and that's the one thing I've tried to instill in most of the kids that I, that I get to coach is that uh, the first time you're going through it, it's such an overwhelming tidal wave of everything going on. Like you're in this river, and you're just trying to stay afloat, and you're trying to, keep, you're trying to stay on the team. And then if you can switch that mindset where you're just like, this is just a good time. And sure, yeah. Like if it, it's, it's hard to instill. It's almost, and some people will take it the wrong way. It's almost like, look, I'm just here to play hockey. I don't care about as much about everything else in the world. The, the wins and losses aren't going to break me as long as I'm here playing my hardest and ultimately having fun. That's right. That's, that's when I was most successful as well. Uh, when I left Utah and I had no idea, was this a good direction for me? Was this a good team for me? I, I, it, I didn't know. I had no idea, nor did I care. I was like, I just want to go out and stop that guy coming down here and throw a nice save and mix it in, make frustrate that kid that has the puck there is trying to score. And I didn't know what level he was playing at or where he, he was going, but I just enjoyed trying to stop the puck. And I was competitive and athletic, and it led to a few more things down the road. And, uh, and when you start thinking about it too much, it's like, oh, I have to play well tonight or you know, people are going to be watching. That's when you don't. That's when it's too much pressure, too much stress, yeah. and you, you you don't rise to the occasion. It's like but, being a goaltender is a lot like golfing every day. Like shot to shot, like you can mess it up if you think about it too much. But if you just yeah. go up there and just have fun with it, yeah. and don't think yeah. about it, and just enjoy the moment. Yeah. That's, there, okay. But so, that said, there's there's preparation that goes into in, in, into success as well. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Like you have to be. It's not fun if you're not prepared to do it. Right. But yeah. So now what are you, fifty one? 
Uh, 50. Thank you. 50. <laughs> 50. I, was Same thing. I know you're three years older than me. So as, as a 50 year old, and now you have a 19 year old, what are your keys of advice to all the other 19 or 14 year old goalies in this market? What, what's Jeff Levy's uh, advice, career advice? It's, you know, it's a, uh, it varies, Jay. I, I've coached in the uh, Junior Grizzlies organization for the last – I took this year off from coaching, but five previous seasons I coached – I was their goalie director, goalie coach for all the age, ages from 10 to uh, 16 during that time. So I coached a lot of goalies, and uh, it was a double-A level. It wasn't a triple-A level, but my son is, was a triple-A player. Um, and every single one of them has a different drive level, a different motivation level, a different reason they're there, a different skill level, interest level. Um, so I try to make it fun for all of them. And I think if, if it's fun for all of them, um, they're going to get better. Uh, so uh, have fun with it. That's when I had success. Uh, I set up drills, which I thought would make them better goalies. I tried to teach and explain why they were doing things and what they could work on and improve on. And I didn't push anybody or yell at anyone that much. But if it was fun for them, they were going to push themselves as, as far and hard as they wanted to. Um, and a lot of them have got a lot, a lot better and a lot better goaltenders and have had fun over the years. Uh, if you're talking about goaltenders that are going on to the next level, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge uh, coming from this market. Yeah. I'm glad you used the word fun. I, I want to tell you that. Uh... I was basically fired from an organization because my number one goal was for the kids to have fun. That being said, hmm. I also physically prepared them. Hmm. Like they, I thought they had the right mindset for games. We had more than a winning record. Uh, we put, you know, I taught them everything. I had them doing everything from yoga to weights to running to everything they yeah. could do to be conditioned and prepared for the game. The way I'd seen over 20 years of being, 30 years of being a goalie, 20 years of being in a, professional league as an e-bug and seeing some of the best coaches in the history of hockey, like Kevin Constantine and Jean-Paul Parisi and learning from them. And Jean-Paul always taught fun. Yeah. You know, the guy was, the guy was fun. Yeah. He was just a fun person. And for, for me to find out after one of the seasons that one of the, one of the chief complaints from the parents was that I emphasized fun too much and they, uh -huh. they were paying too much money for their kids to go out and have fun. I thought, man, you're just missing the boat. So I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you said that because at the end of the day, it's a game. And, yes, you, you have to put in work. And work sucks, but you can make it fun. Like, you can, you can make the drills fun. You can make practice fun. You can set up different challenges that are fun for yourself and make you a better goaltender. For sure you can. Yeah, yeah. So, some goaltenders don't have that in them, though, right? Some goaltenders are just all business out there and are all compete, super high level compete. And you got to recognize that, too. And, but, uh, I don't, I, I think you, you, you set up, uh, set up, set goaltenders up with drills that are going to make them better. Um, they all have different levels of compete and want to have fun and have it in different ways. Yeah. Uh, maybe that goaltender was super high compete level that never smiles or breaks his stick over the crossbar. Maybe that's fun for him. Yeah. And that's so. Jordan Parisi. Jordan Parisi never had fun. Right. He, he wanted to be. He wanted to beat everybody else on the ice. He didn't mm -hmm. want to get scored on in warm-ups. He didn't want to get scored on in practice. He, he, we've talked about it several times on this show. He just had a different mindset. And at the end, he thinks that mindset, because he was also very cocky, and he didn't want to be a backup, and he didn't want to share ice time with other guys. Right. And in the end, when you're backing up a guy like Martin Brodeur or Marc-Andre Fleury, and the coaches aren't giving you your ice time, and you're telling them you deserve ice time, that kind of – that competes good, but it also can get you traded real quick too. So yeah, you, they find a guy that'll that'll be the right backup. Um, then one of the other things I wanted just to touch on is that in one of my camps, I, I had Elliot Hogue, who I was kind of trying to mention to you earlier. He's a goalie mm -hmm. coach in uh, in the OHL, and we had a local player who he had an eye on. He hadn't told this guy yet. He hadn't told his goalie. He said, but he's talking to me, and he's talking to Jordan, and he's talking to some of the other goalies. He's like, I think this kid's good. Like, yeah. I think we're going to, I think we might take him in the Bantam draft. He's good. But for the rest of that week, the kids showed up late. Oof. And <laughs> this, is a, this is a camp where you get dropped off at eight in the morning and picked up at five. You're there all day. So how do you, how are you late on the ice? Right. And that's what this, this guy wanted to know. 
And there were times when we'd be doing drills and instead of doing drills, this kid was off fixing his gear. And it wasn't just once, it wasn't twice. It was a few times where you're like, all right, that kid's blowing off drills. Yeah. And when he, when Elliot left the market, they didn't pick that kid in the draft and that kid has stayed here. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if that kid ever knows. So that's just one of the, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Everything's fun, but you never know who's looking. You don't, you don't, you really don't. I mean, I had no idea when I was being scouted or not. I, as motivation, I, I tell myself I was being scouted every practice, every game. I'd look around and I'd say, tell myself, oh, there are three, three scouts here in the stands tonight because I, I better work hard. I better work hard at practice. Maybe there's somebody here. Yeah, uh, smart. I enjoyed that was motivation for me because I really wanted to try to get to the next level. Um, but it's the little things you do. I mean, some, that's, sometimes that's just not the, that's just the way the kid was raised too. He just yeah. doesn't know better, but I don't know. To me, it seems like common sense. You show up on time, you respect your coaches, you respect your teammates and you work hard and good things will happen if you work hard and are focused. Wow. That's great advice. So uh, how do people get a hold? Like, are you coaching still? Can people learn from you? Uh, uh, <laughs> so I, I was approached many times over the last number of years to do private lessons, but um, kind of steered clear of that. Uh, I felt uh, uh, enough coaching as a part-time job was done for me in the organization, in the Junior Grizzlies organization. Uh, I took this year off. I don't know if I'll go back to coaching. Um, it's, it's, it can be challenging when you, you don't have a dog in the fight. Like I yeah. got my start coaching because my son was a goaltender. So, mm-hmm. and then I stayed with it for years after. Felt like I was really giving back to the, to the sport and Utah hockey. And it felt good. Um, but I've really enjoyed my time away from the, the, the rink as well this winter. So I don't know if I'll go back into, into coaching. Um, I don't have the answer to that. Currently, I'm not looking to do private lessons at this well, time or get into an organization. But I, I didn't um, mean to put you on the spot. I just, no, that's fine. I may get the bug again. I don't, I don't know. Well, that's great. Um, right I mean, now, no, I, I just will go out and I'll, I'll spend some time with my son Hank on the ice and work him over. And uh, he's, a, he's by far my, my best student that I've ever had. Um, how do you? Uh, well, very how, lucky. How did you learn to coach the new style of goaltending? Because it's nothing like what it was <laughs> when you played. Like, did you watch it's video? Or no, it's you... hard. The first time I came out and tried to try to coach, I because you play as you know, yeah. and, you, and you just do right, and you don't think about it too much. I went out there. I'm like, oh my heck, where where do I start? Yeah. I mean, how do I even know how what this kid is capable of, and where do I start? And you just have to, to step kind of out of body and think about, okay, where do you start? What, what are the basic, basic, basic fundamentals? Um, start with uh, your stance and stick on the ice. And um, the more you watch the game, the more you think about the game, if you're not a player as a coach from a coaching perspective. So I had to really teach myself how to coach and, and what to teach. Um, and uh, my game evolved a little bit personally when I was playing. Um, I learned how to play new style, what they're doing now more. So I feel like I've learned to coach it fairly well. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Well, Jeff, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. And I also Thanks, can't Dick. thank you enough for everything that you've uh, done for the market. Like whether you know it or not, you set a whole generation of, uh, of hockey players, not just goalies, but yeah. Utah hockey players on the right path. I mean, you were, you were a trailblazer back in the day, and your work ethic showed everybody else that it could be done. So we, uh, we appreciate everything you've done. Well, that's nice of you to say. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, I want to have you back on uh, in a, like a month or so. I want to talk to Hank, and I want to know what's going on with Hank. And uh, yeah. we got to introduce him to Jordan and make some phone calls and <laughs> start seeing where he's going to play next year and see if we can't get some, use some influence. Yeah, he's got a few things lined up. Steps. He's a good, he's a good player, and he's focused, and he's a hard worker. He'll have success. Yeah, I played with him the other day. He's he's phenomenal, and I'm excited to Thank I'm you. excited to see what comes next from him. Yep, me too. Okay, well, that is the Utah Puck Report. Remember, go to Jersey Mike's.